This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. This is why the Nkunguma Pride is such a firm favorite. It's Kinky Tail. He just looks ready for a fight. This is still her territory. Mm. The Evoker boys are here to stay. Ooh. How insane was that? Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 53rd episode of Safari Lives. Now, my name is Lauren and I have the fantastic Mr. Davi on camera today. And I'm currently up a tree, trying to look nice and elegant and figuring out how on earth I am actually going to get down from here. So, before we introduce quite what the topic is, remember we are live and interactive and this is all happening right now, including my jump down from the tree. There we go, that was quite elegant, I think. So please talk to us, use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or the YouTube chat and talk to us about our characters and the theme of today. So, quote of today, no one in this world is useless who lifts the burden of it for anyone else, Charles Dickens. So when you refer to the animal kingdom, the types of animals that are generally referred to as being useless are normally the males. And since it was Father's Day yesterday, of course, we're gonna focus right on the role of males in the animal kingdom. It's not often spoke about. We speak about mothers, we speak about all the female animals who give birth, have cubs, have young, but we rarely talk about the males. So that is what we are going to dive into today. Talking about loads of different species, and we're gonna pepper it with lots of weird and wonderful examples from the ocean as well. Why not? So of course, males are generally thought to be dominant, aggressive, and of course, there's a crazy beeping in my ear. I do not know what that beeping is. Hold on one moment. Okay, I have no idea. I have a crazy beeping in my ear. I'm gonna try and turn this back on again. There we go. So males are generally thought to be more aggressive, dominant, and of course, promiscuous. Whereas females are thought to be chaste and more passive. Now that is generally how people see the natural world. And of course, it does not quite work like that. We put our cultural prejudices into little box and we cast animals in the way that we think of ourselves regards to humans. So we are gonna change all of that for you today. So we're gonna send you over to someone. I've got no idea who who it is, but let's go and see exactly who it is. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome once again to Safari Lives. And well, we have managed to track down and find Hosanna. Now, Hosanna was around Galago Pan this afternoon, uh, around Voitela Pan this morning. And um, I'm just gonna let Texan know that I'm here. Hang on one second. Tex, if you can see me here, we're just behind you, a bit more to your sort of northern side. And um, I heard lots of monkeys alarm calling, and just not long ago, about half an hour ago, we had impalas going crazy. And then we were in the, uh, in the FC having a look at some clips, obviously, for Safari Lives this afternoon. We saw Tingana walking across on Vubu Road. I'm sure all of you Zoomies saw that as well. And he was following him directly. So my name is Steve. I'm joined by Craig on camera. And, well, we've managed to find the little chief. And it just goes to show you how big he's getting because Craig and I were following him from behind. And we weren't actually sure who it was until he stopped and we were able to get a good look at his face. And he's got a very characteristic face. But it just goes to show how his weight is starting to pick up. Okay, well, I'm going to see if I can get around now. We ideally wanted to find a little bit of, of, of or spend a bit of time with Tingana as well, being a Father's Day special, of course. I'll just get, there we go. Everyone's happy to see Osana. We're very happy to see him as well. We put a bit of effort in. I was calling everybody on the radar to say we heard alarm calls. We saw Tingana, and then the, 
The troops rallied together. They decided where they were going to go, how they were going to go. I listened to the radio. We came around the corner, had Hosanna on a very big termite mound, and he dip, 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 quickly went down. And now we're going to see if we can keep up with him, because he is on the move. Of course he is. It's a bit early in the day, you'd think, but I have a feeling maybe his father materializing in a sighting with him just now has caused him to move a little bit. Um, but the trackers were following Tingana, and they say he started calling not so long ago. So Hukumuri around, his, his big son now, materializing in front of us now. Lots and lots of reasons for Tingana to be getting a little bit upset with the world. So it's interesting, because the road we were just on, I've never seen Tingana come across. So I was almost certain it wasn't Tingana, but I wasn't sure. When you look at the back, we couldn't really see his neck because it was bushes. So that's all we could, that's all we could see like that. And he has gotten so much bigger. Everybody, don't forget we are live and interactive. We'd love to hear from you. Don't forget it's a character-based episode today. So I am going to be focusing on, of course, Tingana, the Duke of Juma, as I discussed before. Also on Horsana who is this young gentleman over here. And then I've also got Tandi, the Queen of Juma. Adamantus, you want to know if I'm following Hosanna or if he's following Tingana? Well, Tingana was following him. Uh, the alarm calls uh, attracted Tingana. He heard Impalas going absolutely crazy. Um, I heard them as well. And so then we were in sort of... There we go, he's going to come out onto Voitel Access Gate and head back, of course, to his favorite pan, as we all know. He's not shy when it comes to hanging around in the same area. But I think he's moving away from Tingana today. I don't think, I know he wants to be here, but he doesn't really want to hang out with him. You know, he's happy that his dad's not going to beat him up, but he doesn't really want to sort of like be hanging around being too close because Tingana will steal his food and if he steps out of line, we'll give him a proper beating. Okay, very good. Well, we're going to follow him and see how we go. There he is. Beautiful, beautiful boy. And while we do that, let's go and say good afternoon to my other colleague, Trishala. Hello everybody, good afternoon. Welcome on board as usual. My name is Trishal and I've got Senzo on camera with me for this very special Safari Lives. I always tell you, it's one of my favorite things that we get to do with Safari Live. And it's nice because you get to recap on what's been going on the whole week. And I think it's awesome. So today I am going to be focused on or sort of focused on looking for lions because I do know that they were last seen cross the boundary north so I might just go there and actually just have a look for tracks maybe we'll be lucky and they'll come in but okay that was original plan but now we've had some intel that two cheetahs were at Little Gowry and they haven't crossed here yet but I'm heading in that direction just to see if we can get lucky and hang about just kind of hang about there and wait a little bit I mean, because it would be awesome to see Cheetah. Now, there was also a Sabui earlier this afternoon around this Twin Dams area. So I'm also going to be looking for her. But the lions are mostly my focus today. For, as long as I establish that they have well and truly not entered back to Juma, happily go about our business of looking for other tracks and other such things maybe even look for a few birds or two I think that would be nice now come down here because this is where Subui was seen uh, maybe because it wasn't too long ago actually well, let's have a quick look at the dam we're here at twin dams As you can see, very dry. Not much going on. It smells quite muddy. 
That makes sense. It does look dismal. Anyway, let's do... Let's do the main road here in the south and see what we can manage to pick up. Anyway, while I do that, and... Oh, that was a good reverse. While I do that, let me send you over to Lauren and she continu can continue with her discussions. So let's really get into the topic of today. Now, of course, I have an egg in my hand. Eggs in general for females are large, okay, not all as large as this, costly to produce, packed with nutrients and fat, and just generally it takes more effort to produce eggs than it does sperm. Sperm is produced in the millions and not that energetically costly to produce. So there is your number one difference between male and females. I'm sure you all know that, but it does affect how a lot of the animals behave out here. Now we did just pass a message on to Trishala, because we can hear a leopard sewing this way, possibly Tingana, because he walked past the dam cam. Hosanna's this way, and there's another leopard sewing this way, which is roughly in the direction where Hukamuri was this morning. He crossed out, but one, two, three, potentially there could be three leopards around here. So hopefully, maybe Trishala might come back and look for them. She is, of course, a big fan of the lions, and lions is exactly what we're going to talk about next. We're going to go into the tent because... In my opinion, lions are one of the most tricky animals to actually talk about in terms of their behavior towards their young. And of course, we're focusing on males, not the females. So we have our first discussion clip of the week with lions. Now, before I go into it in too much detail, I just want to show you the clip. We'll watch it out. It's an old clip, the Birmingham Boys. And this will probably just show a slightly different side to the male lions than what everybody actually has in their minds. So here we go, we're going to play it. Okay, so here we have a big male lion who's obviously interact- oh, ouch, now that did not look pleasant whatsoever, interacting with the little cub. Now what we've seen so far, there's really no aggression here, not really. Slowly but surely, there's a lot of tenderness, a lot of nice interaction between the male lion and the cubs here. Now this clip we did actually use for SABC, but it's absolutely perfect to just look here. Oh, look at that. It's very rare to see the male lions interact with the cubs. Now we're just gonna look at some images now these are some images that I myself took in the Mara of one of my favourite male lions that I have ever encountered who happens to be Mr Capulli. And I actually told some of you before, Capulli has a split tongue. His tongue is completely split down the middle like a snake. I don't think many people realised that before. And here is his interaction with the cubs of the Salt Lick Pride. And it's far more tender than anyone would have ever imagined coming from a male lion. So there's quite a few images here. And all he does is play with them, kiss them, lick them, lick their genitals, which is what parents do, especially mothers to the young. Let them pull his ears, let them pull his mane. Now, why this is so important is because male lions are generally said to have the highest rate of infanticide in the whole animal kingdom. They are known for coming into prides of lions and killing all the cubs that are roughly under one year old. Now the percentage I believe is 27% of cubs that die, lion cubs I'm talking about, is from infanticide from males. Now why do males do that? The main difference between this species, the gender role of male and female is all about survival of the species. That's what it's all about, how to survive, continue on the species, survival of the fittest. So why do these lions do this? Why do they come in and kill cubs 
that is the same species as their own. And it's quite simply, why should they spend the energy and all the time and effort looking after cubs that are not their own? If it's not their own genes, why should they look after them? So they come in and it's their first instinct to kill the cubs, which is a very upsetting thing to see and witness. But it also does something biologically. It actually stimulates the female lions, who the male lions in the coalition are obviously taking over, taking over the pride, to come into estrus again more quickly. So the females will lose a cub and it won't take them long to come into estrus. The male lions can then mate with them and then they will have their own litter of cubs who they will interact with. So interactions that you see like this, it's the same images playing around of Kapuli and the salt lick cubs. He obviously thinks they are his cubs and that is why he has been slightly paternal towards them. If he did not think they were his cubs, infanticide would most likely happen, especially when the cubs are this small. Now, whether the cubs are his or not, who knows? Female lions are known to be very promiscuous. They do sleep with many male lions. And this is due to the fact that they want all the male lions to think that that is their cubs and therefore it will prevent infanticide from happening. It will offer protection. Coalitions of males, when they join up with the pride, they offer protection to the whole pride and therefore... I have no idea, Nina, that was mid, mid my thought. Rosalind is asking a question, but I have no idea what it is. Nina will repeat that again. Well, I hope she will. <laughs> How many cubs can a lion have? It's normally about four, on average about four. I think lions have four functioning nipples, but it can go up to eight. So, not only males conduct infanticide, it is said that females can as well. And this is called filial infanticide. And it's normally when a female has one cub left that she, it, maybe it's sick or it's weak or it, it cannot function itself. It's maybe handicapped. And the female is said to just leave that cub and let go of it or potentially kill it. Because for a female, spending all that energy investment in looking after one cub, nurturing it, allowing it to suckle, is obviously going to offset the balance when you'd rather have a huge litter that you can look after. So it is all about survival. And I can't remember what I was saying before Nina came in. It was something about the males, of course. But coalitions of males, you can actually get from one to eight males in a coalition. Now... Cheetah brothers are generally said to be related. Lion coalitions, they don't have to be. They can be strangers, they can be nomads. A lion who came from one territory on its own is a nomad and another one, and they can meet up and form a coalition. It benefits the male lion to be in a coalition. They can patrol the territory together and they offer one another a bit of protection. But they don't have to be related at all. But some lions and coalitions can be. And you find that the coalitions that are bigger, that go up to eight, which is really, really big, tend to be related, brothers, cousins, related in some way. The coalitions where the lions are not related only really go to three. And these are average numbers. I know you always get random pop-ups of coalitions that are much bigger, but these are average figures. So when they're not related, it's only three. Now, why is that? You would think if you had all these nomadic male lions around, why don't they all come together and create this super duper massive coalition where they can take on the world? It comes down to genetics. They each want to carry on their own bloodline. If they are not related, then these males don't have the same genes as them. So it's better to keep your numbers small. Like the two nomads, the Chelly Boys and the Mara, there's only two of them. And it benefits them to be in a two, but it also benefits them to keep the numbers small. If they're brothers, you can reproduce by proxy. You can litter the world with nieces and nephews and it's still continuing on your own bloodline. So that's how it works in coalitions. And when they take over a pride, the testosterone levels really increase in lions and they get very aggressive. And this probably doesn't help the case of infanticide in lions, but they do what they do because it's an innate biological behavior 
behaviour for them to continue on their bloodline and their genes. But the behaviour changes when they think it's their own. Now, just to wrap up the whole thought on lions here, there's been a study done on mice who also do infanticide within the, well, the males do infanticide. And actually, studies of the brain show that the pathway changes in a male from when they're virgins and they haven't yet mated with the female and they have very aggressive behaviour that encourages them to kill all the young. As soon as they mate with their female, something in their brain changes, the neuron pathway changes and that they actually show far more parental care. So they believe this is the same in lions, but they have yet to get that far. So they're not all bad. Male lions do get a very bad rap, but of course, as you can see from Kapuli here, he was very tender and loving towards the cubs that he thought were his. So we've got plenty more animals to get through, but for now, we're going to send you across to Steve with Hosanna. Well, indeed, everybody, we are with the little chief who, as far as we know, has not sired any youngsters yet. But what Lauren's talking about, 100% correct, lions do get a very bad rap. But essentially, not all lions are killers of cubs, but those that do kill cubs, well, they breed more than those that don't. So essentially, the genetic traits that are passed on from father to son there are more cub killing lion traits than there are not, which is kind of the way it works. Okay, well, there are the people in the sighting, of course. Now here to see the famous little chief who just spending time with him today. The last time I saw him, he was very flat. He wasn't moving very much. And spending time with him now, it's just amazing how much weight he's put on. Because uh, the last time I saw him, he was just flat around the pan. He didn't do any moving. But now we've seen him walking next to the car atop this termite mound. It's been very special. And we'll continue to try and spend time with him. Of course, we might also move on to see if we can find Tingana. Because Tingana was left in the drainage line back that way. But talking about Hosanna, of course, a week of him being back. Let's go and see how he started off for this week. It was no real surprise to find Hosanna on the southern boundary. The little chief had the habit last year of bouncing between Voyetelepan, Chelepan and Twin Dams, all following the densely wooded river system. And this week was no exception. Hanging around one pan would no doubt leave a strong sense of leopard in an area. And the little chief has learned that sometimes you need to actually go and hunt for food as it doesn't always come to you. This day, however, Osana had followed the scent of his older sister, Tandi. And under the cover of darkness, our beloved cat stalked even further. Crossing Gowrie Main, Osana kept on walking, following the familiar river system ever south. Well, Osana does have the patience when it comes to hanging around the pan, everybody. But this afternoon, we're actually seeing him physically. Tell me when you're happy, Craggy. We're seeing him physically going out to areas I have not seen him in before, actively looking for some food. Um, we'll see more and more of this uh, as the days get cooler and also shorter as well. He is definitely a hungry cat. He's always hungry, isn't he? Being very alert. Um, on our way through just now, Craig spotted him looking at a dacre but the Daker basically ran away. Kristen, you want to know if Hosanna will be hurt by Tingana for staying in his territory? And it's a very interesting one, you know? I mean, we've seen them be very friendly with each other. We've seen uh, Tingana actually be submissive towards them, almost saying, it's okay, I'm happy that you're here, as long as you don't start behaving like a territorial male. So essentially what he, if Hosanna starts scent marking and vigorously scent marking and calling, Tingana will have to draw the line there. But as long as he just sort of hangs around in the territory, that is in one of the other vehicles, as long as he just hangs around in Tingana's territory and plays very low key, he should be okay. But for how long? I mean, I'm noticing how much bigger Hassan is getting. No doubt Tingana will be noticing. And there's going to come a time when the little chief is going to probably get pushed out. But it's very hard to say. 
I hope those guys aren't going to just push right in front of our shot, because that's very cheeky. Excuse me, Craigie. They are photographers. They should know better than that. We're playing... We're playing a nice game. They should play the same nice game. Otherwise, it's not going to be very nice, is it? Nope. Everybody gets a chance. So, we're coming through this sort of silver cluster leaf woodland. And let's see if we can get ourselves out here onto the road. This is an area that is kind of between the two territories of Tingana and Hukumuri. So, he's playing an interesting game because not far from here this morning, Hukumuri was seen. And now that is an individual who will definitely give uh, Hosanna a hiding if he gets him. Apparently, Tristan says Hukumuri chased him back up here. So, he chased him back from Londolozi. And who knows, maybe Hosanna's the one who gave him the, the thing on his eye. Hook has got a hook in the eye. <laughs> that would be very funny. But um, we also think that maybe, but there were a lot of tracks of male leopards yesterday. We also think that maybe yesterday, what actually happened was Tingana and uh, Hukumuri had a little bit of an altercation of some sort. Um, we didn't see it, we could only go by the tracks. Uh, but it forced Tingana all the way into the north, and then out of nowhere, Hukumuri suddenly was here again. Okay, well, there we have him, looking as regal as ever, as he crosses the road in his ever search of food. Let's go over to Trish, who's working around the south, and see if she's having any luck that side. Trish has just been fooled. So Lauren uh, told us that she had some le leopard sawing. So we rushed over here. And without thinking, I realized that we just saw Steve. That's probably what that leopard was. But then he's got Hosanna. So I have no idea what's going on. Unless Hosanna suddenly started sawing for you. Did he? No? because I'm sure Lauren definitely heard some sawing. Oh well, we checked it out and it's Steve. So now, and it sounds like he is going to try and follow up on Tingana as well. So maybe it was Tingana that was sawing. Hello, hello, hello. So we are going to go back to our original mission and we will... Oh, okay, okay. Don't know what was said there except a Galago shortcut, so I assume that's what the inside information in the form of the other guys who have stopped for their sunset sunset drinks. They say Galago shortcut. Did they hear it said? Okay. Gonna go shortcut. Oh well, that's still part of the plan. But of course, it's very difficult to actually have a plan here. It's always nice to start with one and see how you go. But it's always difficult because you kind of just have to roll with whatever the bush presents you with. Which is actually one of the more exciting things. Now I'm having a look for tracks. And I don't see any up here. But it seems as if it cut through that... Looks like they may have gone through there. Well, this is okay because I need to go in this direction to check for the lions as well. So this is actually the perfect time. But speaking of the lions, we did spend some time with the Inkahumas last week, which was awesome. And it was so nice to see the three females that could possibly be lactating. We were thrilled to catch a glimpse of the three Inkahuma lionesses this past week. There have been rumours of cubs. The Inkahuma's frequent visits to Juma, as well as the Avoka males, has some suspecting that little bundles of fur may be stashed in Juma. Producing milk for growing cubs is tough work, and if the rumours are true, the Inkahumas will need to be well fed. These lionesses are formidable hunters and have excellent form. Their bodies built to move undetected through the grass, 
and strong muscles to bring down the biggest of prey. A nearby antelope looked like a likely candidate for dinner, but our Inkahuma had been spotted. She seemed unperturbed. The Inkahuma name comes with a certain reputation, and though this time was unsuccessful, it won't be long until these lions tuck into a hearty meal. It was truly awesome to spend some time with them, and we also got to see those two boys when the Inkahumas were around, which was particularly special because to see the way that the mange ridden mangani male looks now it's unbelievable it was also a pleasure not just a pleasure but a privilege to be able to spend time with those three females that may have cubs somewhere around here hopefully you can tell i sounded very hopeful in that clip and that's because i am i would really 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 love to see lion cubs on juma I would, they're just, they're unbelievable. And to have a, a set of cubs that I can watch grow and you can watch grow and have this relationship with it, it's just awesome. Mina Mu, you'd like to know what percentage of lion cubs die compared to other big cubs. Now often the 50-50 percentage is often quoted 50% will survive. I heard a bird go crazy. Let's roll back just silently. Ooh. That was tense. I'm just listening out because if it is that animal, that that was soaring yeah okay ooh, ooh. we have a secret operation going here I'm just trying to stay on the road. Now, we've come to the end of our road. So what I was saying is that because the other animal was sawing before, it could saw again, which would be awesome. And then it would tell us exactly where to go in. But Minamu, back to your question. I'm just going to sit tight here because just to watch, you know, I always told you I'd like to sit and just watch for a little bit. The 50-50 percentile is often quoted, and though it is on average true, that it's more sort of between 40 and 60%, I know it's not a big difference, but that's why Lauren's discussing all these things. We kind of, you can always have a good, a good amount of cubs survive. You can always have all the cubs in a pride survive, but then there's often those ones where many don't survive. But um, like with leopards, it's also a similar percentile. I think it's also it's about 44, 66 percent. And hyena, also quite high. I think it's a little bit less than 50 percent, but it's it's due more to the birth canal than to infanticide or killing because other dominant individuals are coming in but as for the other big cats like cheetah i'm not sure at all what theirs is like see other birds have gone quiet again but that's a really interesting topic and a nice i mean it tells you a lot about cubs and the how much is invested in a cub and how some cubs are born altricial and they, and they sort of with birth are not in the nicest way possible, I mean this. M much is not invested in them. They're born still needing to develop very much. And that's a, one of the strategies that animals use to sort of counter the fact that they lose so much of their young. You'll find lots of animals do that. Do you remember we were talking about K species? and our species and i'm pretty sure i said y species by some silly mistake the last time yes, yeah. let's see tracks let's see tracks okay oh oh 
Mm-mm-mm. It's always difficult. So on this right-hand side where we have the door, you have... Ah, oh, I've got a visual on it. Nice. Firstly, it's always important to get a visual on it. Otherwise, you won't actually know what you're following. But you can tell that when there's no door on this side, it's really easy to look for tracks. And on that side, all I see is the jack. I can't see tracks on that side. So it's always helpful to have your cam up and he can always has that extra vantage view to help you as well. Anyway, while Senzo and I do this investigation, let me send you over to Lauren and she can continue her discussions with you. Fantastic discussion by Trishala. Of course, the lion cub survival rate is indeed 50%. And if you take that 50%, 27%, almost a quarter of it, is due to infanticide. So, of course, there's many other reasons, disease, parasite, like we saw with the Incohumas, white muscle disease, drought, environmental factors, all sorts of things. But that is quite a low survival rate, 50%. So, going back to this wonderful sort of human box ideas where we think about males and females, if you think about the survival of species, it does actually make sense for one parent, namely the female, to actually stay at home looking after the young, nurturing them and spending all her time and energy in nurturing the young, whereas the male goes off to mate with other females, of course, to continue the survival of his species. So it actually makes a little bit more sense when you think of it like that. Now, males may have a bad rep in the animal kingdom, but I am going to try and change that for you all. There is actually many studies that show that fathers, brothers, and even unrelated males can actually substantially contribute to the care of a young. And by having that parental male care, it actually allows for females to produce more more energetically costly litters. So it does have an advantage for the males to be around. However, regarding mammals, males cannot be the sole caregivers. Why? Because mammals rely on maternal milk, which the males cannot produce. So when you're talking about mammals only, of course, it is good to have the males around. It is good to have parental care. It assists the females. It makes a better, stronger litter, but males cannot do it on their own. So our next example is a fantastic fantastic example of a fantastic dad. We are actually going to take a look at wild dogs and of course let's take a look at this clip where we have a male interacting with all the pups. Now within a wild dog pack it's all about the pack. The dog is a pack, the packs are the dogs. It is everything. They are all related within the pack and of course there is only one breeding pair known as the alpha pair. The males will not act aggressively towards the cubs, you can see here. They will play. They will allow the cubs to feed, almost first sometimes. Within a pack, the young and the old are the biggest priorities within the pack. The young will get fed first. The pups will be protected within a pack. They all have different roles. They will have babysitters. They will have those that go out hunting. They will have those that look after the young and the sick. They will have all sorts of different roles in the pack and each and every individual will protect the young. So you can see there's a big mix here. There's young with the adults all interacting, especially with the males. Oh, it's been so long since we've seen wild dogs. Now, with wild dogs, Normally, they can't eat solids until about 10 weeks. So it is up to the mother and the father, mostly the father, to actually chew food, regurgitate it. There we go, I'm just going to close this. Oh, something exciting is happening with Steve. Let's go and check it out. Do you want me to go forward? Hello, everybody. We have found two cheetah here on, Ju on Juma in quarantine. We could see the tent from here, the tail just on the left there, Crago. There's two cheetah right here. We've got a whole lot of impala out here just in the open. Some of the males have been running and running and running and behaving very strangely. And I don't think they've quite seen the cheetah yet. These two cheetah are sort of very well camouflaged behind this bush. They were in the open a moment ago, but we don't want to move lest we influence what is 
seemingly going to be an amazing experience. There we go. One's coming out on the right, Craig. He's just poking his head. There we go. I haven't been able to sex them yet. How incredible is this? I am so excited. We had reports of Cheetah Down and Little Gowry, and then tracks were coming, and then tracks were here, and then we were leaving Hassana, and then we heard tracks were coming north. We thought, oh, let's go give... Let's go give them a hand. And here we have found two cheetah. Um, I don't know how, without really seeing the backs, or to see that them stand next to each other, male and female difference, they're very similar in appearance. There's a slightly bigger difference in size between male and female, and obviously the genitalia. I think I might have heard one was a male, one was a female on the radio, but I've yet to confirm that. So, off the Father's Day topic for a moment, of course, but cheetah on quarantine. Sinek, how rare is it to see che cheetah here? I think this is the first cheetah sighting on Juma this year, if I'm not mistaken, Craig. Last year, we had a female with her two cubs that spent on and off about two months with us. Um, and then they disappeared south again. I think even the female might have died. Uh, Tristan found a male cheetah at Twin Dams randomly last year. Um, but this environment, this landscape, um, is not best suited for cheetah. They need these open spaces with good visibility. And uh, leopards, lions, hyena alike will all outcompete cheetah as much as they possibly can. So cheetah are the lowest on the rung when it comes to the big cats. And they don't have the same family units that wild dogs have. Mm, everybody, Hassan is not far away, um, but he's, oh, he's not very close either. He's on the other side of the drainage line, so probably about 500 meters or so. Tingana's about 500 meters or so on the other side of the cheetah, so they're now wedged between <laughs> two big male leopards, and they're thinking about maybe catching one of these impala here that still don't seem to know what's going on. How incredible would that be to see in this open area a nice cheetah hunt? It's definitely something that we don't get to see. James got to see the female cheetah tackle a kudu last year. It just started stalking and it smashed it. So these things could happen at any stage. You never know. All we can do is bear witness. So for the most part, a cheetah will move and move and move. They do, they are territorial, but they will move in response to food and response to other predator pressures but they're not as bound to territory or to areas. <laughs> We're having a day of people parking in front of us, Craig. <laughs> Let me just move forward here a second. See how you, they could very much likely be siblings. I have no idea about the history, where exactly they've come from. Um, I'm just gonna try and position so we can maybe get them without a vehicle behind, because well, that would be very pretty. There we go, Craig, are you happy? Still not. Impala still haven't spotted them. We thought when we were here earlier, we saw Impala responding a bit crazily, but then Craig saw that the males had their tails up and there was still a little bit of residual rut happening. And the cheetah, no doubt, would have been attracted to those sounds and they could take opportunity where it lies. The males, when they are in the rut, as we all know, they lower their guard. They completely forget about predation. Shari, leopards have been known to kill cheetah and even eat them. Um, I've seen at least two cheetah in my life that have been killed by leopards and then hoisted up a tree. Uh, not very nice to see. Um, leopard are far stronger than them, um, but also they would steal their food. So if a cheetah saw a leopard approaching and it had a meal, it would leave. It wouldn't even attempt to defend it. Same as hyena, they'll just move away. So ideally the cheetah wants to spot the adversaries, lions and uh, leopards. Ideally, but if they don't spot them, they will potentially get killed because unfortunately in the predator world, they, everybody wants to eat everybody. 
Okay, well, everybody, we're going to stay right here. We're not going anywhere, but talking about cat conflicts, we had a very interesting scene with Tingana and the Unkuhumas earlier this week. Nothing is more interesting than watching two different species interact out here in the wild, let alone two of the most feared predators in the bush. Tingana and the Inkohumas had a standoff reminiscent of an 18th century duel. Who will make the first move? At three against one, Tingana retreated to the safety of a tree as one of the lionesses charged towards him. The duke knows his limitations. A lioness can cause serious damage to a leopard and three of them would spell disaster. The wise old duke could only watch on as the lionesses walked off satisfied with themselves. So, as you can see in that clip, um, the predators are aware of each other. They want to either avoid each other or kill each other. And um, they need to be aware of the presence. And that lioness charged at Tingana. And, well, he just did what he does best, went straight up a tree. There's another cheetah going on the left there. Haven't been able to yet get any sex of either of them. Maybe not. There we go. That's a male. That one's a male. So essentially what these cheetah will do if they spot lion or leopard. Let's see this one now as well. She's much, much smaller. It's much smaller. I'm thinking it's a female. I'll have a little look. Using the cover. Definitely looks a lot smaller. It might even be an adult with a youngster, but I don't think you'd have a young female hanging out with an adult male. So there might be siblings. Yeah, that's a female there. And here we go. Something's about to happen, everybody. You can just feel it, can't you? Look at the posturing. Let's see the size difference. It's not enormous, but when they're still... She's a female, definitely when they're still young. There won't be a huge amount of difference in it until they become mature. Oh, isn't that special? What a special shot. I'm sure Lauren, who's just over there, she could probably even see us now, is absolutely seething that we're here with the cheetah. <laughs> she does love cheetah most out of all of the cats, don't you, Lauren? She's listening to us right now. One of the benefits we have of being in the tent, we get to watch the show as well. Little tentative footprints keeping low to the ground. Spoke yesterday about uh, ears and uh, who's got pointed ears and round ears. And see the cheetah as well as Hosanna when they go up onto termite mounds or they go stalking. They really do flatten those ears and using as much cover as they possibly can. Eyesight. They want to get sort of as close as possible before launching what would be oh and some male impala are running chasing a female don't move craig they're going to take advantage of her if she cuts this way i'll definitely take advantage of a male who's lost or dropped his guard and he's so interested in the rat still that he has no idea the two of the fastest land mammals in the world are staring them down can you see the slightly different size between the one on the right and the one on the left? It's very, very different or slight, but when you see them together, you can see it. But if you see it just on their own, you can see the difference. Fancy cheetah. <laughs> Interesting now how, how adept your name is. How long do siblings stay together? Well, if they're males, they could stay together their whole lives. Um, what often happens um, with females is they break away very quickly as they start reaching maturity. Okay, he's going to chase. There's a male impala that is busy chasing a female there. And they're going to just get a little bit closer to them. A little bit closer. So for probably two years, they'd probably stay together. They could be still with mum for those first two years. 
they could still be with mum for the first two years, but then as soon as mum sort of lets them go and she needs to have some sort of more babies of her own, uh, then there's a very good chance that siblings might stay together for another year or so. Uh, but females generally start getting the urge to mate and then they move off. Uh, whereas males, if they were brothers, could stay together for many years, obviously, as long as cheetahs do survive. Out in the wild is not as long as the other cats because of the amount of pressure that they have. Craig, you, you just tell me if you want me to move. Just slightly here, huh? Yeah, I think we'll just stay right here. Right here and see what happens. The uh, impalas are getting very, very sort of feisty with each other, but they are still very unaware the fate that awaits them. They know out here in these open plains that leopards aren't going to be able to sneak up to them. Lions, probably not. Uh, but they haven't been expecting two cheetah to come out of nowhere. Ourselves also. We weren't expecting cheetah today. That is the mast behind there in a the rainwater tank. I apologize about that in the shot. They are the impala. Are very unaware of what's going on. Julie, the cheetahs really won't affect leopards too much. The only thing that they really would do is that they have a very similar sort of food base. So impala would form the sort of prime sort of food base for, for wild dog, cheetah, leopard. And of course, of course, also the smaller games such as Steenbok um, would also fall under that. So they'll compete for same sort of resource, but there's many, many impala around. Um, if anything, the leopard will outcompete the cheetah. They've got better strategies and survival abilities out there. But that doesn't mean that they won't kill the cheetah just because. Just because. And cheetah aren't that aggressive. I've never known or heard of a cheetah killing others' cubs. Uh, it probably is possible. It kind of is normal with all or your big predators. If they find the youngsters of another, they will kill it. But I don't know if cheetah do that. It's not something I've ever come across. A cheetah killing the cubs of another. But they're being patient. They're waiting for that male impala to chase another female around and then we might see them strike. Okay, well, the impala are just a little bit too far out of range now. Doesn't mean it won't happen. Lots of impala normally out here in these open clearings of quarantine. Hey, wouldn't that be wonderful to have two cheetah decide that this is quite a nice spot for them. It's water just around the corner. All they need to do is keep away from the leopards for a little while. Shari, cheetahs aren't known to hoist kills. They don't have the necessary strength in their their claws or their feet, um, their bearing to pull up an animal. So they kill through speed. They don't really have sharp enough claws. Uh, they can climb, but not as well as leopards. And to hoist a kill would require a lot of effort, a lot of strength. Um, and essentially only leopards have that ability, the strength in their body and in their claws and in the, the claw sheaths to be able to physically grab the bark. And imagine pulling yourself up a tree using your fingernails and then put something that weighs equivalent to you, maybe even more as well. Um, so cheetah won't, don't really have the strength for that. So they kill and then they eat as quickly as they can on the floor often losing their kills to many, many things. I've even seen cheetah abandon a kill at the first approach of a vulture. Oh, let's just move to the side here. That's beautiful. Brother and sister, I'm supposing. Maybe a, a, a girlfriend and boyfriend for the day. She does look quite young. Are you happy there, Craigie? Yeah. Magnificent. Okay, well I think
think it's all settling down for the moment. <laughs> Ian, how far can a cheetah jump? Um, it's a good question. At full speed, they cover um, about nine meters at a full sprint. Um, both feet hit, both pairs of feet hit the floor, and then they extend their feet out with their back arching enormously, and then that gives them a huge amount of sort of stride. And I've been told that they can clear a gap of about nine meters at full tilt, uh, which is what nine yards, which is is a decent amount of distance. Impala, I believe, can clear twelve meters, so twelve yards, at full speed. Um, but they don't have the same turning ability that a cheetah has. The Thompson's gazelle being the best turner in the business. Um, Impala, if they see cheetah, their objective is to pronk and stot that rocking horse sort of gait as they run away, indicating how fit they are. Cheetah will always try and select the easiest looking prey. The animal that is unaware or maybe limping or a little bit weak something a youngster of course they'll always go for youngsters i know that sounds cruel but you catch what's the easiest thing to catch Cool. Well, we were about to offer to relinquish our spot, and the other two vehicles have left, which is great. Okay, well, Trishala is still on the search. We are going to stay right here, everybody. We're not going anywhere, and if the action does happen, you will come right back to us. What a treat, hey? I think that's a really awesome treat and we knew that they were in Little Gowrie and we just missed them but we managed, Steve managed to get them which is awesome. Oh, it's just such a treat. Now I am going back to some tracks that I saw on Twin Dams Road because we have looked at the tracks on Gallagher and then did a loop round. So we did the whole block and then there were tracks going in the opposite direction. So it seems like there was a lot of up and down movement on the road there. I'm not sure why though, but they might, it seems as if some are just slightly old in others and others are quite old. So I think it's a combination of those, those roads not having been driven the whole way up. And there's a few sets or stages of track weathering going on. Okay, let's head down to Twin Dams where I had those other tracks and see how it goes there. As for lions, I just heard an update that the Talamatis with their cubs are near Big Dam. It's very far from us, very, very, very far from us, but at least it's close enough range that I could hear the update on the radio. Let's be thankful. There might just be a possibility in the next few weeks that they could steadily steadily move in this direction which would be awesome <laughs> and then if there's cubs of our own of the Inca Humas in here then the Telemates are welcome to stay just at the boundary so there's no fighting we don't want that anyway we were delighted to spend some time with the Avoca bales at least I was I always enjoyed spending time with them they're just magnificent creatures so let's have a look how their week went and it was quite a raw filled week the avoca coalition graced juma with their presence last week the visit was not simply one of leisure as once the darkness swept over the bush it was time to get to work <laughs> The mighty roar of the lions called well into the night. No intruder within earshot would doubt their presence. These two brothers have regularly been seen together on Juma, while the third patrols the north. The hold on their territory is strong. 
and with the possibility of new cubs, so is their legacy. If we manage to find a stash of cubs on this property, uh, I, I think I might lose my mind. I don't know what will happen. It was, it's always been one thing of mine. I really, really want to see lion cubs just out here in the wild, purely in their own environment. I would love that very, very much. And I'm sure you all would as well. Well, you were all very lucky because you got to sort of grow up with the Inkahuma's first lot or the most recent lot. The 2016s, was it? And to watch them grow all the way up to adulthood is just awesome. Oh, let's go to those cheetahs. Lucky, lucky Steve. Thank you, Trish. Well, <laughs> one more male chased another female around in a big circle, and it caused this, this one to jump up and start moving. But it wasn't a very well... Or it wasn't too much of an effort. Just a little bit, but I'm... So bizarre, the other Impala can... I'm sure they can see these cheetah now, but they haven't responded at all. Um, normally, Impala, when they see cheetah, they go absolutely ballistic and move away. But our friends, we're not going to look at them now because the cheetah are way more inviting, are feeding and scratching themselves and looking very nonchalant about the whole affair. Wow, Michelle, I actually have no idea about that. Um, I need, we need to possibly have a look at the, the recent census that was done. Um, I wonder if anyone out there knows. Please, hashtag Safari Live, if you know who, the, what the resident population at the moment is of Cheetah in the Sabi Sands. Because I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. I don't think it's very much. It's far less than the leopards, of course. Uh, but obviously the cheetah do move. Uh, they go up into the other reserves north of us. They go into the Kruger Park. So it's hard to get a real accurate estimate because of the amount of area that these guys cover. A nomadic sort of lifestyle. They don't have the same sort of territory as our leopards that we can de uh, sort of mark and identify. Cheetah are constantly moving. Different family groups all the time. I've seen a handful in my life in the Sabi Sands, which has been quite awesome. But far more leopard here, for sure. Seeds. You'd think we are in the Masai Mara right now, and watch out, I'm going to photobomb us once more. <laughs> okay, well, it's getting to that time of day when it becomes a little bit more tricky for cheetah to hunt, because Osana's not far away, and Tingana's not far away either, and they both respond to the alarm calls. So we're going to stay right here. We're not going to go anywhere. And while we do that, let's go back over to Lauren, who wants to complete her previous discussion. The cheetahs were right there, right there. That's quarantine just over here. And that's exactly where Steve was with them. Can you believe it? My favorite, other than hyena, my favorite favorite, my second favorite right there. I really can't believe it. So I'm going to jump down from here now that I don't need to look at. Just to quickly go back to what we were saying before, wild dogs, fantastic parents, communal breeding, it's all about the pack. They need the male, not just 
course, value that he brings to the pack. So the pups actually can't eat solids until 10 weeks old. So after about a month, after about four weeks, what they do is they, the father will eat, chew, swallow, then regurgitate the food back for the pups. Now that's dedication because the pups cannot eat solids. So done lions, done wild dogs. And now we're going to talk about my other favorite favorite, hyenas. It gets a little bit more complicated. And of course, if anything happens with the cheetahs, don't worry, we'll head right back to them. So the male role within hyenas is very unique because it's a strict matriarchal society. It's all about the females. The females are bigger, they're stronger, they have very very similar genitals to the males as you all know and they're not really part of the strict hierarchy so this is one of my favorite males Saka I love this male interacting with the cubs at the Juma clan den why are you not playing there you are now if you look here there is some biting going on, but I can assure you it's not aggressive. These two are absolutely just playing around, doing some wrestling, if you like. Saka is welcome at the communal den. Why? Because he has been with the Juma clan a long time time. It's all about tenure. You will get accepted into a clan. The females will not be so bad to you the longer you have been there. So males have a choice. It's very tricky for males in hyena clans because it is all about the females. Their choice is should I stay or should I go? Should I be Philopatric and stay at home in my natal clan or should I disperse? What is the decision here? What is the advantages of so you have Day. You will always be higher ranking than the lowest ranking hyena. Okay, hope you follow me. It's all about hierarchy. So a male and his natal clan will have good stands. Yes, he's a boy. He'll have a good position. He'll be in a very good stance with all the females around him and he will get great access to food. But what about his mating opportunities? Should he disperse? In the end, it's said that all males actually do disperse in order to keep flowing the gene flow shall we say spreading the wild oats sowing the seeds however you want to put it if males choose to disperse they will go right to the bottom of the ladder they will be at the very 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 bottom even if they were higher ranking before by joining a new clan what's happening here is you are coming in at the very bottom you are will not have great access to food you probably have to fend for yourself a lot eat the scraps it's not a great position to be in and females that's the main reason you left to get more opportunities to mate with different females now there is a study that showed recently that actually there's a higher percentage of males that actually stay with their natal clan than we originally thought but overall it's a higher percentage that actually disperse if it's a big clan like the one in namara and the male has a lot of chance to mate with many different females from his natal clan then he can stay and he may well be in a better position. But if the female pool is low, then he's obviously going to disperse to somewhere where the female pool is high and he has more chance to mate. But the hyenas don't make it easy. They make it really tough. They literally just want the males for sex. Everything else they can do on their own. They really put the males through a tough time. And by the males sticking it out, not complaining, keep going with it, this is tenure. The longer a male is with a clan, the more the hyenas will trust him, if you like, and the more mating opportunities he has. So Saka here actually has more, more likely mated with the females. We don't know this. We haven't done genetics, but he's very welcome at the Juma clan. He seems to know the cubs. He interacts with the cubs. So for the females to actually let Saka interact with the cub, they know him. They trust him, which kind of shows he's been around a long time. So it's really not easy being a male hyena. They really have no role within the sort of hierarchical system other than mating. Sometimes I do feel a little bit sorry for them. So that's three very contrasting different species. And I'm going to throw one from the ocean in and show you an indigo hamlet. Now, this is a reef fish, a coral reef fish, a very beautiful one that we actually saw on Dive Live a lot. Now, when we talk about gender, we tend to think male and female. But it's 2019 and gender roles are all very fluid and lots of 
different categories of genders arise. Now, this guy is a simultaneous hermaphrodite. Now, what that means is he has male and female sex organs inside of him at the, well, him, her, this is going to get confusing, at the one time. So, where's my seat? Uh, my fish gone. There you go. Is he male? Is he female? Who knows? How can you categorize that? He has the male, he has the female. Now, you also get se sequential hermaphrodites when you start off one sex, like a clownfish, and as you go through your life, you will change sex. But the indigo hamlet actually has both organs. So when he meets another hamlet, they have to choose who's going to be male. One of them will take the initiative to take the male role, use the male sex organs and produce the sperm. The other one will automatically fall into the female position. So whoever takes lead in this meeting, I can't say him and I can't say her, the first person that takes lead will take the male role, use the male sex organ and that is how they mate. The, the other one will just fall into the role of female. But that's not to say the next time this one that took the role as female mates might then take the role of male. They have both sex organs, so they can completely mate with whichever sex they wish to mate with. Yes, very complicated in the world of fish. It's really, really not that easy to get your head around. And th this sort of behaviour does not happen in mammals. People used to think that hyenas were hermaphrodites, but in fact, of course, they're not at all. But within fish, hermaphrodites is really common. And the indigo hamlet is the absolute pe perfect example. <laughs> so after all that complicated sex talk, we are going to send you back to Steve with his cheetah. Thanks, Lauren. Well, everybody, the impalas have seemingly finally noticed that there are two fast cats here in the middle of the open area. It started off with this squirrel that you can hear shouting. And then some of the impala realize, oh, oh, there's something out here. And they've all been looking now at these cheetah and shouting their defiance as well. So maybe these alarm calls that we can hear are going to attract Fasana, who was not far away. The two vehicles that were following him have both joined us and left, and he was seemingly heading back in this direction. So he might get sort of uh, attracted to these alarm calls. He might also be walking straight across the other side of quarantine down to his favorite watering hole, Vuitella Pan. So one of you out there, please be aware if he does materialize on the dam camp, let us know. Okay, well, this week we've had lots of time with the little chief, of course, and well, where better to find him that than at his favorite watering hole. The little chief slept curled up in a little ball in his usual hangouts around Voyatilla Pan. Impala are not easy to catch when they're in large groups, and now that the rut is over, Osana was forced to bide his time and not give away his position. The little chief has learned that patience at pans pays off. Lapwings, however, are more effort to catch than they are worth the eating. Signs of hunger and boredom were obvious. Shifting his seat, Osana settled in for the day, waiting for the cover of darkness. Well, he is a professional pan sitter, is he not? And, well, he definitely knows how to sort of spend a lot of time doing nothing, Osana. He takes after his dad in that, in that regard. Something that cheetah do, do a lot more, they do a lot more walking. Seems like Osana, now after the other day he disappeared down south, he went all the way down to London Losey, can you believe it? Where I mentioned before he was chased by Hukumuri, came all the way back up again. I think he went down to go watch James Hendry perform down at London Losey on the weekend. I'm certain that's what happened. <laughs> and now he's back again, of course. And uh, after spending a little bit of time with him not so long ago, just now, uh, and comparing him in sort of weight class to this, which is the male cheetah here, he's so much bigger. So much, so much bigger. And he's only three and a bit. So the comparison in weight and strength, we were talking earlier about cheetah being able to climb, and they can climb. They don't do a very good job of it, but they don't have the strength to pull 
anything up. None of your business cheetahs do stalk. They'll actually stalk for a good hundred meters or so um, if the terrain allows them to. I've got a moth on my hat. Oh, hello, moth. How pretty is that? Also got a bit of branding there. Let's hide that. How pretty is that guy? <laughs> So if anybody can identify that moth on my hat, Craig, it was actually my camouflage. So talking about camouflage, cheetahs will actually stalk as far as they possibly can uh, before launching a very incredibly fast attack. Um, that is kind of what they do. Um, and they can even lie in wait for animals to come closer and closer. So it doesn't mean that they don't stalk. It just means that they also use a lot of speed. Um, cheetah often start their sort of chase or their attempt from between 100 to even 300 meters, uh, whereas a leopard would never do anything like that. They would, they need to get to within 20 meters before they attempt anything. So cheetahs can suddenly, out of nowhere, you can be watching these two now, and they can suddenly just explode off the blocks, almost like sprinters at a race. And all depending on what they're going for, whether the animal is paying attention, uh, what the terrain looks like, all of that will determine how the cheetah approach. But um, they do have lightning quick acceleration. But, uh, we saw a couple hunts in the Mara. I had the Lamai boys who weren't hunting. I had Lope who hunted. He started with a little with a little lope. Lope, how funny is that? Before launching into a little bit of a faster stride, but he never really dropped his gears. Um, and then we also had uh, Mugi, who attempted a Thompson's Gazelle, but never really dropped it into the proper gears that I've always wanted to see. So it's incredible the cheetah will start off, and we had a clip with Pat and his cheetah and just last night. He did it a little while ago, in fact, in the Mara. And those cheetah caught up to that younger wildebeest like it was standing still. So they do stalk. And they will get as close as they possibly can before launching. And then they really, really do take off. Christine, there's a very good question. And something I've always really concerned myself with is I've seen Impala and Kudu uh, respond very differently to leopard than they do to cheetah. Now, how from 50, 60 yards does a leopard or does an Impala know that a cheetah is not a leopard and a leopard's not a cheetah? Uh, they know there's a difference between them because they respond differently to both predators. Um, so Impala will snort and come closer to leopards um, keeping them in their view, whereas with cheetah, what they normally do is they snort and run away, uh, pronking and stotting and jumping up and down. So they know the forward-facing eyes, uh, the shape of the body is very cat-like and it is a predator, and instinctively through their genetics, they know to fear that animal and to run away from it. Uh, those who didn't got eaten and didn't have any babies, talking about lions putting forward their genes earlier. Um, those who, who survive a breed, those who don't survive clearly don't breed. So uh, I remember having uh, a friend having a shirt with a tiger picture on it and vervet monkeys seeing this shirt, just a picture, and going absolutely nuts at the shirt. And then he'd close the shirt so that they couldn't see it anymore. They'd calm down, and he'd open it again, and they would just completely panic once again. So that picture, that image of a cat is instilled, it's ingrained in the most species sort of mind. Even, even us, I suppose, the first time we see a lion, if you just happened to be walking in the bush, you didn't know anything about the wilderness, and suddenly there's a lion in front of you, you would know that thing could potentially eat me. <laughs> Don't you agree, Craig? Yeah. Craig agrees. <laughs> so I think they do know. They do know that predators. And uh, they do behave differently for lions, leopards, wild dog. Wild dog, they don't make a noise. They just run away. Run before they pick me. That's, that's how I've normally seen them re respond to cheetah. Uh, these guys aren't really doing that now. And it's possible because it's getting darker. Or maybe they know that if they run the other way, they're going to run into Tingana. So I think they're quite happy to see the cheetahs in front of them. 
and hopefully they catch their friend. Okay, well, Ch Trishala is north of us. She's still searching. Hopefully some lions will materialize for her this afternoon. Let's go see how she's getting along. I am searching, but I got diverted just a bit, so I am no longer north of you, but I'm now south, but I'm coming up north again. So these, there seem to be tracks everywhere. I've even heard over the game drive radio that there were, so we went up the Gallego area where I told you that there were lots of tracks going up and down, and it seems like that up and down sort of behavior, perhaps it, it looks like two leopards as well. It's not one leopard. So it extended even into the northwestern corner. So I'm going to do my bit and see if we can maybe locate this animal. So I'm going to zoom up there, but I am going to do it via Twin Dams, which is in the central sort of area. Very popular road, you know, Twin Dams. But I'm going to do it via there because there were also tracks on Twin Dams that were quite fresh. Now, I feel very on a mission today. I feel very focused. And I'm even, I'm even like counting down the time and being, no, 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 I've only got this many minutes left. How many people get to say that about their job? Hey guys, let's just say hello to you. We've got our lovely herd. Little do they know that their mates nearby were being stalked by cheetah. It seems like a mostly a bachelor herd. I see no females. Oh, good scratch. Oh, I must let you know. Oh, we've still got some testosterone brewing just a bit. Not enough to make them fight, but still some. I was going to say, I must tell you, in the same area, I often see that impala that had the big growth on its neck. Do you remember that? It almost looked like it had a humongous Adam's apple. So I've seen it. In fact, I saw it yesterday. So it's alive. It's well. Um, we should keep some tabs on him. I think that'd be awesome. All right, let us go. Since our impala, it's so sweet them and they tussling just a little bit. It's actually really amazing. So you see, obviously, that the rutting season has sort of come to an end. So their buildup of testosterone is steadily going down and going down. And you'll find that in their behavior, a similar thing happens too. So they still have like residual animosities, shall we call it? No, just some residual aggression associated with the testosterone. And they're fighting. Just every now and then, like yesterday, they were burping all over the place, doing their usual sort of impala rutting nonsense noise. And we were babysitting Hasana, actually. And I got to spend some time with him. There must have been four herds of impala that just strolled by him even ones were rutting and doing their burp and everything and he didn't even he was just not interested but there's a water buck about a hundred meters from him all the way on that side and that for that he lifts up his head so he entertained me very much when I was sitting there with him good old Hosanna but I am actually hoping to find his dad because the tracks that I had were big, big male tracks. And the only animal that I know around here that's gonna make a track like that is Tingana. I had a really nice, good look at Hosanna's tracks on the same time when I was babysitting. So you have, Hosanna was sitting right, you know, by that log at the moment. And then it, he walked to the side of the car to get into a spot of shade behind us. And in so doing, he obviously left his tracks. And it was so nice because you saw clear ground and then you, he walked on it and you saw his perfectly clear track. So it gave you an indication of, in your own experience, what a super fresh track looks like and exactly what Hasana's track looks like, which is invaluable. That type of knowledge is 
it's really invaluable. You're going to use it all the time. Whenever I'm tracking, I now know looking for now individuals track. And what that's really nice because we're adding sort of layers and layers onto what we can do out here and how we guide. Now I'm just using this road to get to the other side, but no harm in looking for tracks. I still don't see any though. Hmm. Okay, I don't see it. So, original plan, let's go Twin Dams and then we're going to go up north and have a look at where all these leopards are going to. In the meantime, let's go over to Lauren and she can continue her discussion while I continue looking. Let's get into my favorite time of night when the sun is beginning to set and golden hour really is here. I love it out here. And I've taken my cap off. Oh, I want to be a little bit more glamorous without the khaki cap anymore. So we need to get going. We're running out of time. Parental care in the animal kingdom actually refers to the level of investment that both mother and father will put into their offspring for their development and their survival. So by parental care is probably the strongest out of all the groupings of animals and the entire kingdom in birds, especially your passerines. Many birds, up to 90%, are actually said to be monogamous. Now, hold up there. There's social monogamy and there's sexual monogamy. So that can also refer to one nesting season, one breeding season, a few breeding seasons or a lifetime. So when you use the word monogamy, you have to be a little bit careful. And there's been lots of studies done where there's been a monogamous pair of birds and they've tested the DNA of the mother and the father and they've tested the DNA of the young. And it's not the fathers. So there's a lot of um, extra pair meetings, shall we say, when it comes to birds. So referring to passerines, we're gonna look at some of the greatest dads in the animal kingdom. And I think that goes to the weavers. They put a lot of parental investment into their young and let's take a look at exactly what they do. Now, I think the name gives it away, but weavers weave. And what they do is they make these little balls, if you like, that are completely handmade, completely woven. And what they're trying to do is create the perfect little environment for to raise young, where there's minimal sort of any effect from parasites. And it also creates a little microclimate inside for the offspring, which will be perfect to raise young. So they're actually working really, really hard here to attract the females and say, hey, I've made the perfect little ball to raise the young it's the perfect place it's got the perfect conditions and you want to be here basically that is what the weavers are saying so the females will come and inspect they will check it out and they will decide and it has been known that if a female is not impressed with the, the workmanship if it's too shoddy for her she has been known to destroy it completely destroy the poor male's hard work and then just leave and the male will just start again also, the males are known to completely destroy their own work if it goes past a few days. The females are very fussy and they will not accept these little balls, these little nests if they are over a few days old. They must be fresh. So the poor weavers work very, very hard and they're said to make up to 50 of these balls within one breeding season. So they're very, very dedicated to creating the perfect little microclimate for his offspring. And that is quite a high level of parental care. Birds show it a lot. Mother and father both show care when it comes to raising their young. So that's one example. We've got many to go. And of course, I think you maybe saw this image earlier, but one of the greatest fathers in the animal kingdom goes to the seahorse. I actually took this image myself in Indonesia. There's seahorses everywhere there. They're incredible. And the male is known to be the main parent. So the male does not produce the eggs. I must clarify that. He doesn't produce them. The female produces them. But after a little bit of courting, you know, forget Tinder, forget speed dating, they will court one another. The male will, act, the female will actually deposit her eggs and put them into his pouch. And then he is the one who will fertilize them and then raise them until they hatch. It's all on the father. All the female has to do is produce the eggs. Now, the father's pouch is actually a really complex organ. It controls the temperature, the water salinity, also the blood flow, all sorts of things to prepare the young for the life 
at sea. As soon as they hatch, they're on their own. So the, the father of the seahorse basically does everything. Why? Why would that be the case in the animal kingdom? Well, one of the theories is that it allows the female to then continue investing all her energy in making more eggs. So the father will do all the hard work, the female will go back and start producing more eggs and getting ready for her next load of offspring. Again, it goes back to the survival of the species. Difficult to get your head around. Of course, in the human world, the fathers do not carry the babies or anything like that. It is obviously all the females. But in the seahorse world, it's the fathers that do it all. And the female has to actually give her eggs to him. So we've covered a whole range of animals. We have got a few more lined up, not too many, as the cheetahs have just blown us all away tonight. And hopefully, they might do something exciting for the rest of our time here. But that's just a few examples on land and in the ocean of a completely different diverse range of parental care in the animal kingdom. So talking of those cheetahs, let's go back across the sea and see what they're up to. Thanks very much, Lauren. Of course, you would talk about the seahorse being the ocean, uh, ocean person that you are. And really, really interesting. Seahorses are such strange looking creatures. <laughs> such a strange. I've never seen one in the real life, but um, I've no doubt you have. But our cheetah, well, these two cheetah are sort of nomads that have been sort of roaming around the central parts of the Sabi Sands for the last two weeks or so. No one really knows who they are. They're not that thorny bush family that we had last year, the mother with the two youngsters. Not them at all. And that's just how it is, like what I was discussing before. Oh my word, Craig, I've just got to reverse back here because we're about to see something absolutely spectacular. The moon is just about to rise behind us. Tell me when you're happy, Craigie. I'll try and position it in a way that we can get cheetah and moon. How's that? Slightly more, there we go. There we go, ooh, that is officially the full moon. Well, the full moon happened sometime today. Full moon obviously uh, happens at the exact time the sun sets. Unfortunately, we've just gone into the IR. And Craig, are we able to go out of the IR for a moment and watch the moon rise? That'd be wonderful to see. There we go. We are out the IR now, Nina. So if you want to show the viewers the wonderful strawberry moon that Tristan was talking about yesterday. Hmm. How marvelous is that? So these two cheetah have been hanging around and no one really knows who they are, where they've come from. They're very relaxed. Um, and I say that because, well, we've been able to get within, what, 25 meters of them without any stress, uh, which indicates that they're relaxed. Cheetah that are not relaxed, you will not get within 100, 200 yards of them. So it means that they've been habituated, they've spent time with people, but probably have come from somewhere where they've been habituated, but not ecotourism people in the Sabi Sands, or someone would know who they are. And hopefully they get to stay around. We're just discussing this wonderful open area of quarantine that the moon is blasting its beautiful rays down upon is such a wonderful open landscape for the cheetah and i was saying to craig while we were off air that they came walking from the south through all the thickets that way and they suddenly came out to this open air of quarantine and we're like whoa we can see we can see this animals we can see far so hopefully they stay here for a couple of days that'd be wonderful okay so thanks nina we've now gone back onto the cheetahs so i'm sure craig will once again engage the infrared and of course, everybody, we are going to be using absolutely no lights in this scene. We are in the open here. We are keeping our eyes peeled for any hyena that might be in the area. But uh, the cheetah have got plenty of escape routes with whichever direction they want to go. We will not be shining any lights. Even probably keep the presenter light to an absolute minimum. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that, everybody. I've got a bit of dust in my nose. Oh, Beard, do you want to know if I know how old these cheetahs are? I think they're probably in their first two years. 
Um, I'm just guessing that by the fluffiness of the female's neck um, and the male a little bit bigger than her. So I'm guessing that they're siblings and she's not fully grown yet. I mean, I, I'm, I'm no cheetah expert at all. So if anyone out there has been watching and you know your cheetah intimately and you can tell me if I'm talking a load of nonsense, then please do. I'm no, by no means, I'm an expert. I mean, when you see two youngsters with the, the mum, you get a much better idea of size and age. Um, or should I say of, of, yeah, of age? Of course. But right now, the male is slightly bigger than the female, but I don't think she's fully mature. She's still got a bit of growing to do. Still got a bit of um, bit of skin to fill. So what do you all think out there? Anybody? Craig? You've seen a lot of cheats in the Mara. What do you reckon? Now oh, Craig is is agreeing with me around two. If anybody out there has any idea, we obviously don't know where they're from or when they were born, who the mum is. So without that information, it really is just a guess. But it's wonderful to have them here in quarantine. I know I've made many of yours day today. I've made my day very excited finding the little chief so early on. And then uh, seeing Tingana on the dam cam before going on a drive show was telling me it was going to be a wonderful afternoon. And I'm sorry we haven't gone to hang out with him or to go and find him. But it's not that often we get cheetah on the property, everybody. So I hope you will allow us uh, the opportunity to be showing you these guys today because who knows where they'll be tomorrow. Okay, well, it seems like our cheetah are going to be lying up here for some time. Trishala has got a similar idea to myself, and she would like to show you the moon in a little bit more detail. It's always lovely to stop and watch the moon rise, especially when it's beautiful and pink like this. Oh, Senzo and I had to stop. I had to stop just to watch. And it is even more spectacular in person. It never gets old. Never, ever. Now, I believe it is the strawberry moon today. I think. Uh, I'm not actually sure why it happens. And um, I actually didn't know it was a strawberry moon until Senzo told me. He first decided to do a dance, and I said, it's, it's going to dance, it's going to dance. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about, Senzo. And then he proceeded to tell me about the moon. I'm going to dance about the moon. And I said, oh, is that that strawberry moon thing I've been seeing all over the place? And then he said, yes. And, of course, it did its little dance, according to Senzo, as it rises, and it just starts to become visible. Over the horizon, apparently it does a little jig. Which I'm sure, next time Senzo and I on bushwalk, I can hold the camera and he can show it to you. He thoroughly agrees at the back. <laughs> he whispered a soft, yes. Because he knows he loves it. But you can see, really it's stunning. Robin, you are thinking along the same lines as me. I was just saying, I didn't actually do any research into why this is happening at the moment, but a lot of the time, the color that we see, especially with the sun and the moon, and particularly when they're rising, tends to be associated with the types of particles that are in the air. And that can also change the color if perhaps the moon is at a closer distance to the Earth or a farther away distance from the Earth. That can also change the color. And that has also to do with the particles because now the distance that's being reflected is either less or more. So obviously it's scattering the light and it appears that this particular one is reflecting pink light. For some reason that's what the particles are doing. That's what I can think of or at least that's what happens with the sun and the colors. Really beautiful. Now I wonder if this means like those cheetahs will be settling in for the night since this full moon is adding so much light that it might be actually difficult for them or any of our other predators to hunt. They'd want to get all of it done pretty quickly because as soon as the eyes become accustomed to the darkness and assisted by the full moon, their chances drop drastically. 
Now, I am going to move on and <laughs> continue with our plan. It seems that we've been pulled all over the place by these tracks. But I am... I have a good feeling about the central area where the drainage is there by where Hosanna likes to hang out. But you see, this morning there were also a lot of tracks around there into that drainage and Tingana around there too. So, all right, let's go see some uh, tracks and uh, hopefully find a leopard. But, you know, Tandi can be particularly hard to follow. So, apparently, we're going to have a look at just how hard it can be, especially for us through the thickets. The Queen of Juma showed off her elegance and beauty as we followed her southwards along the Umawati River. The light could not have been better as Tandi catwalked for us in style. Every signpost along the way was visited, checked and nuzzled, followed by vigorous scent marking of her own. This behaviour may be an indication that the Queen is ready to mate. Tandi investigated every thicket along the way, sniffing out where potential prey may have been. She gave pause on the odd occasion to listen for the quiet footfalls or movement of some concealed prey before finally laying up in a sunny spot to enjoy the morning sun. Tandy is so good at doing this and I think even yesterday when I had her, she truly dragged me through some, through some awful stuff she did. But it's always worth it, every single time. And to be quite honest, I, ex I enjoy the thrill of sort of keeping up with them. It's amazing. Now, oh, look how wonderful this is. It's like I'm driving to the moon and not into that trunk. <laughs> okay, well, I seem to have some uh, spotlight problems. Would you like to see how many I have? I have one and I have two. Two spotlights, none of which are working for me tonight. But with that, I will send you over to Steve and he can tell you what a close relationship he has with spotlights now that he's known as Spotlight Steve. Thanks, Trish. I'm terribly sorry to hear about your spotlight problems. Um, our cheetah are on the move, and unfortunately, it looks like they're going to go away from quarantine, or maybe they've spotted something. They're off behind us. I'm just using my lights here so that I can see where I'm going. They might have spotted something over there. Oh, sorry, Craigie. They might have seen something. There's lots and lots of general game around. Well, in the form of impala fortunately without using any light it's not easy to to get them in the frame obviously the infrared can only get so far sorry craig i forgot about my break there we go so they're right here at camp i mean if lauren stuck her head out the tent she'd probably be able to see them but unfortunately <laughs> we're not going to put any light on them so she won't actually see them and with this full moon, there's a very good chance that they might even leave. If it wasn't full, they'd probably stay on quarantine because now that it's getting dark, they wouldn't want to go venturing away from the safety of these open areas. Their eyesight's very good, but they need sort of visibility. They need clearance. They need the lack of bush to be able to see and to detect the many predators that will offer them sort of some danger. There we go, look at these beautiful shots. Oh, you're looking at that tree, are you? I'm going to show everybody how you can climb. There's going to be some wonderful tracks on quarantine in the morning. I'm doing a bush walk, so I'll be able to come and show you these cheetah tracks. Well, hopefully they don't get uh, driven on. There's a very good chance that they will get driven. So going to walk right past us here. Hello, gorgeous. We are so blessed. We are so blessed. Hey, look at that tail. Such a thick, long tail, isn't it? A rudder for balance and top speed. Doesn't seem to have the same life 
that Hosanna's tail has. Okay, well, they're still on quarantine here. We will um, try and reposition and get another view. Not too late for them to catch something. So we, while we do that, let's go back over to Lauren, who has got some more Father's Day chats. I thought I would climb a tree so that I could also look at the moonrise and I can see it just behind Davi and it's absolutely fabulous. But we are also giving you a Good look at the orange horizon of the sunset. So I can literally see both in my vision right now and it is incredible. So Davi actually made me climb this tree and I don't think we actually thought this through on how to get down. So are you ready? I do need to get down because there's lots of topics. Well, a few topics that we still have to cover. Now this is either going to be amazing or it's going to go epically wrong. <laughs> Alrighty. Hey, I think I did it. Not bad. I'm quite good at climbing trees, actually. Now, there's lots of vehicles around, so something is happening near the tent. So I just want to go into some more weird and wonderful animals before we forget, or before I forget, turtles. Now, oviducal sperm storage, which is where the female is able to store sperm in her oviducts, is actually quite common among all taxa of reptiles. But testudines can actually store multiple sperms from multiple males and can actually choose which ones. Terrestrial testudines can actually mate with the male, store the sperm, then hibernate, then come out of hibernation in the spring and then fertilize her eggs. So she stores the sperm for a very long time as they all can. But if we were to refer to turtles, another image I took of hawksbills, the amazing thing is that they can actually store sperm from multiple males. Oh, it's gone to a seahorse. Why has this happened? I do not know. You can see we have a lovely diagram by James here. It's very famous in camp now. So we'll go back to the turtles, two female hawks though. Yes, they can actually store sperm from multiple males. So all they need is to mate with the male and the male has nothing more to do with them. They will never encounter that male again. And turtles are said to be completely promiscuous. So they will mate with many different males, but one mating with one male will provide enough sperm to completely fertilize all her eggs for an entire season, an entire season of egg laying of different clutches. So why do we need to be promiscuous? That's the question. Is it because they want to have sort of sperm assurance? They want to make sure they've got the sperm in case they come across a time in the ocean where they don't meet the males? Or is it because they want to be selective and they want to choose the best one for their eggs? There's actually an example of a green turtle who all her eggs were actually analyzed and they contained all the same father's DNA. Instead of being mixed, multiple clutches can give multiple paternities because she's promiscuous. It was all from the same male, even although she had mated multiple, multiple, multiple times. Then there was a study from a hawksbill. These are actually two hawksbill turtles here, hawksbill females, where the female laid her eggs. Two to three years later, I actually think it was three years, but I'm not 100% correct, so it's either two, two, three, somewhere in that region, they tested the DNA of her eggs again and it was from the exact same father of the clutch three years ago. She had stored that sperm for three years. Now that is absolutely incredible. So within turtles, it's all about the female. She gets to pick, she gets to choose and the, f the fathers, the males, have absolutely no role to play whatsoever. Going back to the best dads, the last discussion clip I have for you, I'll get rid of these turtles and I will show you the last clip here, which is indeed termites. And some of you might be thinking, termites, huh? Well, termites are actually said to be incredibly good fathers because there is only two termites, the king and the queen out of the whole colony that can actually breed, that can actually reproduce. Now there's a million females around and the male can't have any of them. They're all workers and none of them can actually have sex and none of them can actually reproduce. It is only the king and the queen and the king is completely loyal to his queen for about 20 years, he will not stray. And I don't know if that's just because he can or he won't. We'll leave that question unanswered, but he stays with the female and he just constantly fertilizes all her eggs to produce little termites. And they are said to produce about 
five million offspring per year so that really goes to dad of the year he maintains his queen he looks after his queen he's loyal to his queen and he produces a fair amount of offspring five million per year that's really impressive so out of all the dads in the animal kingdom i think the termite is the one that should be termed the stud pretty impressive so I think we've covered a lot of ground here, a lot of different weird and wonderful animals and the way that they reproduce. But now we're going to send you back to Steve, who's still with the cheetah. Thanks very much. We continue on. We continue on. Our cheetah have gone into the thickets away from quarantine. So we've decided to leave them and we'll see if we can follow up on them in the morning so now what we're going to do because it is um was my original objective for the afternoon was to try and find you tingana so we're going to head around the corner here around gallego this is kind of where he was headed hosana was here this morning or this afternoon then he moved away we found him tingana was left somewhere here but it's possible he's also moved he is being very territorial at the moment, as Tristan was discussing yesterday. Um, he's really, really full of himself, and I think it's a lot to do with uh, Hukumuri um, coming in again, Tandi, whether she's in estrus or whether she's not, I'm not 100% sure, but she definitely seems to be quite vigorous. So it gives him something to fight for, and well, we spent some time with him early in the week, and that's exactly what he was doing. The old Duke Tingana sat on top of a termite mound in the late afternoon, surveying his proud territory. With Juma now in the grip of winter, the vegetation has changed dramatically. The grasses that lay before him have become dormant, dry and dusty, while the trees, once seemingly impenetrable thickets, lose more and more leaves each day. Tingana, like most leopards, use termite mounds as a vantage point for spying out unsuspecting prey. If no prey are detected, why not announce one's presence to the approaching night? And, and so as you can tell, he is still calling. I know I probably might have hinted to the fact that he was fighting, but he wasn't fighting in that clip, of course. But we think he's getting into all sorts of scraps, but it's hard to say without physically being there to see it. He definitely arrived back last week with a bit of a limp, and he's just, he's just, as Tristan says, he's a beast. He's telling us all that he's not going anywhere, and I think he's also enjoying another seasonal change. Uh, his sawing is definitely going much further now that winter is upon us, and the vegetation is dwindling. Uh, we're able to see so much further than we were before. Uh, looking forward to my bushwalk tomorrow. I'll be doing some medicinals tomorrow on the Tuesday morning, Monday for some of you. And we will try and track down those cheetahs, see where they've gone to, see where Hassan has gone to as well. Herbie's back and strong and feeling fit. So I'm very excited for the morning. But let's see if we can find Tingana for you now. Hello, Robin. Well, I was talking about the openness of the Mara or the comparison between the Mara and Druma. Oh, Craig, should we go to the dam or should we go that way? Decisions. Oh, I'm facing this way. Let's go this way. So the Mara is ideal in the Serengeti for cheetah because it's open. They can see very far. Just like the area there at quarantine, it's open. They can see quite far. That has been manipulated. Uh, it has been bush cleared and maintained as an open area. Um, for the most part, the Sabi Sands and many parts of the Kruger are quite bush encroached due to the provision of water, the lack of fire, and the increase in general game that leads to overgrazing. Uh, so leopards fit in here perfectly because the habitat that has been created by the water points and the overgrazing is all these edges, these thickets with little bits of open, thickets with little bits of open, which is ideal habitat and feeding for impala. Um, and impala are very, very, very good for, for leopard. We also have lots of dacre here as well, lots of scrub air, lots of franklins. 
and the leopards are thicket specialists and cheetah need open plains. So with the lack of open plains, this habitat just becomes more suitable for leopards. But anyway, uh, let's go back over to Trish, who is going to be sending you off again to what was the clip of the week. Well, Trish is bumbling about without a spotlight at this time because both of my reliable spotlights have gone out. So it's obviously a little bit more difficult. I can't look into the bushes and I can't see eyes, but I can still drive around and see if something manages to pop out onto the road in front of me. So many, so much of the time that just happens. It's all about timing. If you and that animal just make it and cross paths, you know, it's the difference between three hours with a lovely leopard or three hours of me just driving around, much like you have today, but two hours. Anyway, at least I get to send you to some wonderful clips, don't I? And last week, Lauren had an awesome sighting of some saddable stalk being particularly violent, but very entertaining nonetheless. The saddlebull stalk is the picture of elegance, even when our resident couple at Chitwa Chitwa Dam are engaged in a bit of a domestic dispute. He saw the fish and tried to catch it. He missed because of her distracting him. At least that's what he says. Mrs. Saddlebull stalk, however, believed she could do it better, and so she did. She took out her many frustrations on the still alive fish, her sharply pointed recurved bill perfect for the task at hand. The ease with which her beak sliced through the fish shed new light on the wrath one may incur from a saddlebull stalk. Once she was satisfied with her now sandy kill and her frustrations had been released, it was time to eat. With a quick rinse, a few more stabs just to be sure, and one big gulp, she proved to Mr. Saddlebull Stork just who's boss. It's really nice to have those kind of like sightings because you have a thorough insight into how they're handling their food. And although you may read about these things in books, it's one thing to actually watch it happen. So that was one of really, really special Treats that we've had here. Anyway, let's go to the hostess herself so she can bid you all good night and well. Oh, what an incredible drive and very unexpected. We are finally giving you our view of the moon. I think you saw it from Steve, you saw it from Trish, and now you're seeing it from Davi and I in the tent. Isn't that glorious? The moon rising. So unexpected cheetahs to say the least and for me a great topic of the role of males all across the animal kingdom with Mr Hendry's lovely drawn in the background. I'm really not sure about my egg yellow hair but I'll accept it. I thought I was a blonde but clearly I am egg yellow. I think that picture is going to live forever especially he gave himself huge biceps. Mm. <laughs> He did, fantastic. So it has been an incredible conversation. I really hope you all enjoyed it. It touched on the ocean and on land and the diverse role that male plays all across the animal kingdom. I was teasing at the start about saying useless. There are not, of course, how could we survive without males? We can't, unfortunately. Davy is nodding his head. Yes, you are right. I mean, think about it if you're an anglerfish. I think, some, I think I have brought this up on drives before. You have the females who are huge. Then you have the males that are tiny. They spend their whole life seeking a female when they find her they're so happy to find her that they actually latch onto her with their mouth and they fuse to her they become part of her she can have many males attached to her anywhere on her body she can have a male sticking out here a male sticking out here and they fuse to her like small testicles that just continually supply her with sperm so she actually walks frogfish walk anglerfish walk on their fins their pelvic fins which have been adapted they'll just walk across the ocean with 
testicles attached to them. I think that's the only way that you can describe them because these males are not really even males. All they do is just constantly supply sperm to the female. They're that happy that they found the female in the vast, deep, dark ocean that they just attach to her. They use their mouth and that is what they do. So the ocean is full of the weird and wonderful, slightly abstract, a little bit different from how it works on land. But of course you have those animals that are really invested in maternal and paternal care, especially your birds, and then you have your animals that are not. Now, I didn't touch on the leopards because we talk about it all the time, and Tristan talked about it a lot last week. Hosanna and Tingana, there is your perfect example of your cats, similar to lions. I have no idea what Nina's. Worst dad My what? Opinion on who's the worst dad. Who's the worst dad? Oh, goodness, I don't know. I think that's too much of a topic to touch on now. But I was talking about Tingana and Hosanna. So, yes, Tingana's obviously very tolerant of Hosanna being around. And it, he's the father. He knows he's the father. That is his bloodline. That is his gene pool. So from his point of view, yes, he doesn't want Hosanna taking his kills or his ladies or his territory because he's protective of them. But at the end of the day, Hosanna is still his genes, his investment and his offspring. So that is probably why he is tolerant on some really basic biological drive. He's tolerant of Hosanna because it's one of his own. So I really hope you've enjoyed today's drive and topic and the cheetahs. Please do join us tomorrow for our sunrise drive as normal. Until then, we'll see you later. Mm -hmm.